So let's begin the class. So today we're going to finish talking about equity risk. Start to talk about the cost of capital. And maybe we can start to get into the calculating returns. So we'll also talk about the second assignment a little bit. So the last time we finished saying that we said that we have different types of investors, right? Individual investor and institutional investor. Usually the institutional investor is diversified. If we are diversified, we have no project risk. We talked about this in risk, right? No country risk. Okay, I invested Institutional investor, I invest in Amazon. Do you know Amazon? Yeah. So, because I'm diversified, I have no project risk, I have no country risk, I invested in a lot of different countries, a lot of different industry. Okay? So, I can accept from Amazon, because I don't have all of these much, I don't have any of these risks, Amazon is not adding that much risk to my portfolio, okay? Whereas, if I am the individual and I own my own business, okay, let's say I invest $100,000 in my own bookshop, okay? Do I have $100,000 invested in another industry? Do I have $100,000 invested in another industry or only in the bookshop industry? Do I have $100,000 invested in another country or only in Korea? Do I have... Okay, so do you understand the extra risk for this person? If there is a crisis in Korea, is this person invest affected? The institutional investor, they're diversified? If there's a crisis only in Korea? No, they invested in a lot of other countries, right? If I'm a small business owner and there's a crisis in Korea, am I affected by the crisis? Yes, okay? Uh, you can turn on the light in the is on the back of the room. <coughs> so, uh, there are Student, there are a lot of seats up here, so I'm afraid I have to invite the students from the back of the room to sit here. So, can all of the students who are sitting at the back of the room come and sit here? Everybody who is sitting at the back of the room, can you come and sit up here, please? All of you guys, up here. So all of the students from the back of the room, you need to sit up here at the front of the room, okay? I think from looking at some of the midterm test scores, some students are not listening to the class. They're just sitting there and daydreaming or doing something else, okay? I think if you sit up nearer to the front of the class, it's going to help you to pay attention in the class, okay? So there are a lot of seats up at the front. So we can pretend that this is a smaller classroom, only the classroom doesn't go at the back, okay? From now on we need to sit nearer to the front to pay attention more in the class. 
Okay, so I own my own business. Okay, I'm not diversified. Do you understand? I have all the types of risk, not just market risk. So the risk is going to be higher for me than the I'm invested just in the bookshop, risk is higher for me than an institutional investor who invests in Amazon and all the other places. So let's see the calculation. Okay? In the Bookscape, which is the private bookstore, the average market beta is 1.35. The average R squared of the comparable publicly traded firms is 21.58%. Okay. The correlation with the market is 46.45%. Where did we get those numbers? Back to the regression. Okay. We did the regression of the books stores and we found the R squared. The R squared, we don't have to worry too much where it comes from. We just have to know the R squared tells us the estimate of the proportion of risk of a firm that can be attributed to market risk. So from the regression, we get a percentage which tells us how much of the risk of the firm is attributed to market risk and how much is firm specific risk. So we find that out for bookstores. For bookstores, how much is market risk? So we have the four types of, five types of risk. We have market, country, okay? we have industry, okay? competition and project. So, what R squared is telling us, how much is the market risk? This is telling us the R squared. And then the rest of these non-diversifiable risk, or sorry, diversifiable risk, we can tell one minus R squared, okay? So, in this case, we found out that the R squared uh, is 21.56. Okay, and the correlation with the market is 46.25. So we just put these into the equation. We put the market beta over the square root of R squared equals 1.35 over 0.4645 equals 2.91. So this is how we change. We use the R squared in this equation. We put the beta over the square root of R squared. Okay, so we get the square root of R squared. Square root of 0.21 is 0.46. If we do on the calculator, we know square root. Square root of 0.21 is 0.46. We divide this into this and we get the number. This number tells us the beta for the private company. Okay? So now the cost of equity for the private company is 3.5% plus 2.9% percent beta multiplied by the market premium, 6%. So that is 20% total, okay? We should know this equation by now. Risk-free rate plus beta times the market premium is cost of equity or equity risk, okay? So we looked at the equity risk, it was just 11% if we didn't include all of these types of risk. Okay, it was 11%, a lot lower. Okay, so what that means is that the bookstore owner, they need to make profit of 20%, right? To cover themselves, they're, they're all of these types of risks that they're taking. Because they're taking all these extra risks, they need to make a profit of 20%. Do you understand? Whereas the owner of the stock in Amazon, who is diversified, they don't need to make a profit of 20% to cover their risk, okay? A profit of 11% is enough to cover their risk. Do you understand the, the, the idea here between the two different investors, okay? And what that means is that the cost of capital is lower for Amazon. So Amazon can get money at a lower cost than the private business, okay? That's one of the reasons we can see the big company can have the advantage over the small company. Okay? The big company can raise money from investors and it has to pay them just 11%. Okay? But the small company needs to make 
to pay back their investor if they don't have a diversified investor. So, do you have any question about this, the difference between the private firm and the public firm? Small private firm and big public firm? Who has a lower cost of equity? Big public firm or small private firm? Whose cost of equity is lower? Whose equity risk is lower? Big company. Big public company. Investor in a big public company. Okay? They are going to have lower cost of equity, lower equity risk than in the private company. Okay? Why? Why? What's the reason? Because they are diversified investors. Okay? Private person who set up their own private company is not a diversified investor. Okay? So they have higher risk. They're diversified, lower risk. Okay? Does everybody understand that? Okay? So uh, let's do some questions to review this part. So, first of all, the debt to equity ratio. So you can find these questions also in your book. Okay? So discuss these questions with your partner and answer the question. <coughs> to check the understanding. So the questions are on page 59, okay, question 14, question 15, okay, on page 59 in your book. So if you don't understand, I'll be walking around, so ask me if you don't understand the question. If you have a problem with the question, then ask me. Thank you. 
by now the debt equity ratio, right? What does ratio mean? One thing compared to the other thing, okay? So we divide debt, we put debt over equity, right? Debt to equity ratio, debt is first, debt is on top, okay? So try to remember that, don't forget that again, okay? Debt equity ratios, quite straightforward, should just take three seconds, okay? Debt over equity. 30 over 60, 50 percent, or 1 to 2, okay? So the second question you should, you need to find the equation. Yes? Labor. Lever? Lever means including debt. So good question. What does lever mean? Levered means including debt. Yes. Unlevered means not including debt. Okay? So unlevered is imagine the company has no debt. This is how risky the company is with no debt. Unlevered. Levered means the company has this amount of debt. The company has 90% debt. It's more risky than a company that has 10% debt. Okay? So we have to find the lever beta for the company. On lever beta is industry, and then lever beta is for a company, individual company. Okay? So on lever beta we're talking about industry. This is how risky it is for a company which is in the book industry with no debt. Okay? Then how much debt does company A have? How much debt does company B have? Okay? Makes the lever beta. So you're asked to calculate the unlevered beta. We have two calculations about beta, right? One is levered beta is equal to the other one here, unlevered beta. Okay? On page 55 at the bottom, BU is unlevered beta. U is for unlevered. So we have the levered beta on the top, 1 plus So the levered beta on the top, okay, 1 plus 1 minus the tax rate multiplied by the, here we can see debt to equity ratio, okay? So, uh, Make a note of that so it's easy for you to find, right? If you have to do it in the exam, you should know where the equation is. So we have on lever beta 1.5 over 1 plus 1 minus t. Somebody asking what's t? t is tax rate from ct. n is usually used for time, okay? 
tax rate is 30%, so 1 minus T is 0.7, multiplied by debt to equity ratio, they told us is 0.8. Okay? Zero point seven multiplied by zero point eight is 0.56. Okay? So we have one point five over one point five six. Alright? So more or less that's one. Okay, one point zero one maybe something like that. Okay? So this does this make sense? Okay, we have to check our answer. Does it make sense? Our lever beta is one point five. Should the unlevered beta be higher or lower? Which is higher? Levered beta or unlevered beta? Which is higher? Levered beta is higher. It's going to give a higher risk. Okay, we have debt. Debt is risky. Unlevered beta, no debt. Not as risky. Okay, so unlevered beta is lower, so that seems correct. Okay, so our answer is correct. Do you have any question about that? If you're in the exam, what's the first thing you need to do? Find the equation and? Write it. Write the equation. Don't start writing here. In the exam, you need to write the equation on the paper. Okay? So, next question. Okay, this is on the book on page 60. Page uh, 59, sorry. <coughs> Question 16. You're analyzing a luxury handbag company and find that the regression estimate of the firm's beta is 0 0.9. The standard error for the beta estimate is 80%. So we can have quite big standard error. The average unlevered beta of comparable firms is 1.25. The firm has a debt to equity ratio of 50%, the tax rate is 30%. Okay? So, uh, here we have the unlevered beta of companies. Okay? And now we need to do the other way around. We know the unlevered beta, find the levered beta for the company. Okay? Part A. Then, part B is if the standard error is 80%, what is the range of betas? Okay? From where to where could the beta be? So first the A, just find the levered beta. Okay? So part A, you don't need you just need to start from here. The average on levered beta is 1.25. This is the debt ratio of the company, and this is the tax rate. So what is the levered beta of the company? Beta including debt. So find the equation for levered beta on the next page, write down the equation and write down the answer, okay? Uh, 
thing I do is I write down the equation. I look back in the book. The question asks me, hey, what is the levered beta? Okay? I go to my book. I find levered beta. I write here, levered beta equals, okay? Unlevered beta. Multiplied by 1 plus 1 minus tax rate multiplied by debt to equity ratio. Okay? I already got half the point in my question. Okay? Now I just put in the numbers. Unlevered beta. I go to the question. I find the word unlevered beta. Here it is. Unlevered beta. Okay? Then I find the number. 1.25. I write here. 1.25. Okay? Then I find the tax rate. Okay? The tax rate is 30%, but I don't write, do I write here 30? No. What number do I write? 0 0.3. 0 0.3. Okay, and debt to equity ratio? 0.5. So what's the answer? 1.6875. Yes. Okay, so does that look correct? Yes. That's the levered beta is higher than the unlevered beta, 1.25. It looks correct? Yes. Okay, that's the correct answer, okay? <laughs> so the second part of the question, the standard error is 80%. So if the beta, the regression beta here is 0 0.9, what is the range? 80% on one side or 80% on the other side? What's the range? 0 0.182? Uh, 1.62. Okay. So that's, we just find out, this is about 20% of that number, okay? And this is plus 80%. This is minus 80%, this is plus 80%. Okay, do you understand? The range, you understand range? Range in the middle, 0.9. This is 80% this way, okay? This is 80% this way. That's a range, okay? 80% lower, 0 0.18, 80% higher, 1.962. 80% of 9, 0.9 is 0.72, okay? Minus 0.72 or plus 0.72. So what's that say? If the standard error is 80%, it means the beta can be anywhere from here to here. We're not sure, okay? This is our best guess, but the beta could be anywhere from here to here. So which beta are you going to use? The regression beta or the bottom-up beta that you calculated, 1.67? Which one are you going to use? 0.9 beta from the regression or the 1.67 that you calculated, bottom-up beta? Which one are you going to use? The levered one, yes. Why? Because it includes the... So it... it, it uh, show uh, as maximum risk. No, that's not the reason. That's 
compared to the unlevered beta against the regression beta. The regression beta is I use the historical data from the last 20 years about the company. Okay? Using the historical data of the last 20 years, I looked at the difference between the stock market and our company, the S&P 500 and our company. And I said, according to that difference, this is the beta. So we have the historical be beta here, and we have the bottom up beta here. Bottom up beta, we look at comparable firms. Do you understand comparable firms? All the comparable firms, and we add in our debt. Okay, that's the bottom up beta. We looked at comparable firms that are in the same business and bag indus industry, and we have this much debt, okay? So this is our beta. So it's correct, we should use the bottom up beta, but why? Especially in this case, why? Based on the current economics or the economic situation? Yes, that's one reason. But it's very obvious. If we look at this question, we have a standard error of 80%. Is this a reliable number? No. 0.18 to 1.62? No. No. Is that a reliable number? No, it's not. More accurate. Okay? Yes. There's not enough data here. Maybe we only had data for 20 years or 10 years for the company. If we only have data for 10 years or 20 years, then the standard error is going to be quite high because we don't have enough data. How do you say standard error in Korean? Hmm? How do you say standard error in Korea? Did you study statistics before? Hands up, who studied statistics? Korean students, who studied statistics? Nobody studied statistics? Did you study statistics? How do you say standard error? Maybe I could say... Did anybody look this up in the dictionary when you were answering the question? Did anybody look this up in the dictionary when you were answering the question? No? Okay. So if we have a little data, we're going to have a high Kyojunocha, a high standard error. Okay? So the regression beta might not be accurate. So that's why it's better to use this beta. Okay, find what's the set. We have a lot of other companies, especially if we have a lot of other companies in a similar business. What's the risk in that business generally? And then what is our debt ratio? So the last questions then explain the following terms that we studied. Marginal investor, average return, standard error, we see here cyclical firm and discretionary purchases. Okay, new words that we saw in this chapter that we should understand. So you can, if you know that already, explain to your partner. If not, look back in the book or look in the dictionary. Okay, for these words. Check your name. <laughs> <laughs>
Marginal investor. You had on your test who was the marginal investor. What does marginal investor mean? The investor who has the most influence on the stock price. Okay, the investor who is most likely to be buying and selling the stock. Is Bill Gates buying and selling the stock in, in Microsoft? No. No, he's not. Okay. Usually, institutional investors are marginal investors in the company. Okay. Average returns. What does that mean? Average return. Can anybody tell me? Okay. So it's a mathematical average of the return, the money. Returns is the money we get over a period of time. Okay. So average return means over five years, over 10 years, over 10 months, more than one, okay? So I made, I made $50 last month, I made $20 this month. What's my average return? $35, okay? Standard error, what does standard error mean? Okay, so we have the definition there, right? We're looking at how far, it, we're just, this is an estimate. Regression beta is just a statistical estimate, okay? So how much is it possible that it's incorrect, okay? How confident are we that our estimate is correct? If the standard error is very high, we're not confident. If the standard error is low, we're confident. What is a cyclical firm? Cyclical firm. 
Want dat is zeker toch mee. Wat is cycle mean? Cycle. Recycle. Cycle. Cycle is a circle. What is... Cyclical firm is affected by market conditions. Okay? So it means that the economy is going well, the company is going well. The economy is going badly, the company is going badly. What kind of companies are cyclical companies? Travel agency. Travel agency. Right? Hotels, for example, okay? That kind of thing. Restaurants, even hairdressers could be a little bit, right? Especially for women's. women's. Women might, if the economy is going bad, they might not pay for the expensive haircut, or they might not get their haircut as often, okay? As before. Non-cyclical firm? Not as affected? Kimchi? Kimchi company? Are you going to stop eating kimchi if there's a bad economy? Huh? Do you eat kimchi every day for breakfast, dinner and lunch? No. No? Which one you don't eat kimchi? Sandwich. Huh? Sandwich. Lunch time you don't eat kimchi? Do you have kimchi for breakfast? Maybe. Usually? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're not going to stop eating kimchi, right? Do you guys like kimchi? Do you have kimchi for breakfast? No. Every day? No. Do you have kimchi for breakfast? No. No? Huh? Kimchi and rice? No. I don't understand how people eat kimchi for breakfast. But I'm just a different culture. They don't understand either, right? I eat cereal. Cereal. Okay? Then, discretionary purchase. What is a discretionary purchase? Okay, a little bit similar to cyclical firm, something we can live without, we don't need, okay? So, uh, can you give me an example of a discretionary product that we don't need, we want? Sports cars, okay, luxury bags, right? So we can see, uh, it's a little bit related because often the discretionary purchase can have a problem in the crisis period. Okay. So we look at the type of firm, how risky we are, we're making the bottom up beta, and then we add on the debt. Okay. So we find the average unlevered beta of companies in the same business, the same in industry, that gives us our unlevered beta. Then we look at the tax rate and the debt to equity ratio of our company, and we find levered beta, and that tells, we put that into the equation, risk-free rate plus beta plus risk premium equals equity risk, okay? So do you have any questions then about equity risk? No? So then let's go on to the cost of capital. So now we, we found out how to find the cost of equity for the company and the cost of debt for the company. Okay, also called the risk of debt or risk of equity. Okay, but also called the cost. So the cost of capital is a composite cost to the company of raising financing to fund its project. Composite means including two things, these things. Equity and debt. Okay, so we know the cost of debt for Disney we know the cost of equity for Disney. Now we have to find the cost of capital. Capital is just money, right? So clearly that's going to depend on how much debt our company has and how much equity our company has, okay? We already said that the cost of debt is always lower than the cost of equity. It's less risky than equity, okay? So the cost of capital, also called the hurdle rate, is a weighted average. We see weighted average again. So it's a weighted average of the cost of debt and the cost of equity. The cost of capital is the minimum acceptable hurdle rate that's used to decide whether to invest or not in a project. So the hurdle rate means we have to, it costs us this much to get the money, 10% or 15%. Okay? So our profit needs to be higher than what it costs 
Imagine I have a restaurant, and just for simple sake, I don't use any equity, I use 100% debt. 100% debt, and the interest rate is 10%. Okay? Then my cost of capital is 10%. It costs me 10% to get the money. Am I going to run the restaurant if I think I can make a profit of 5% a year? Why not? Huh? I will be bankrupt. It's lower than the cost it, for me to get the money. Is money free? No, right? Money has a cost. That's called cost of capital. So I have to earn higher than my cost of capital if I want to run the business. Okay? So the cost of capital is giving us a hurdle or a line. You understand the hurdle? In athletes they have to jump over the hurdle. That's why they use the word hurdle. Okay? It's giving me a line that I know I can make an investment decision. Do the project, do the business, or don't do the project. Okay? That's the point of calculating cost of capital. I know how much it costs me to get money, so that means that uh, I can make a decision, right? Whether to invest or not. The second part, after we finish this, we'll talk about calculating return, and we compare it to our return. So a firm should be able to make a return profit which is higher than what it costs the firm to get money. That is the most basic theory in financial management. Okay? We have to make a higher profit, a higher return than the cost of money, than the cost it get, takes us to, of money. Right? So we spent the last few weeks talking about how to calculate the cost of money, the cost of debt and the cost of equity. Okay? We'll spend the next few weeks talking about how to calculate the returns, possible returns, okay? So here's the equation for cost of capital, the weighted average. Cost of capital is going to be the cost of equity multiplied by its weight, equity over debt plus equity. How much equity do we have in the company, right? Plus cost of debt, debt over debt plus equity. That's the weighted average of the cost of equity and the cost of debt. Okay, and we're going to use, an important point here is we're going to use the market value of debt and market value of equity and not the book value. Okay, uh, we, talk, we briefly talked about book value and market value. Book value is uh, the accountant's measurement of the value of the company. Market value is the value in the market, so they're different. Okay. So market value is based on the stock price. Market value for equity is very easy to see. We can see on Yahoo Finance, market value of equity. <coughs> so, I go to Yahoo Finance, and I go to any company, tell me any company, the name of any company listed in the US? Microsoft. Microsoft. Okay. You will be doing this later for your company in the second assignment. Okay. So what we want to find out for Microsoft is uh, we want to find out how many stocks do they have and what's the price of the stock. That will tell us the value of equity in the market. Does that make sense? How much is the market paying for one stock? How much do people pay for one stock? Let's say $50. And how many stock do we have? One million stock. Then the market value of equity is 50 million. Okay? So here it is, uh, market cap. Market cap of Microsoft, 404.89 billion. Is that a lot of equity? 404 billion dollars? Yes, that's the amount, of, that's the market value of equity in uh, Microsoft. Okay, so we go to Yahoo Finance, key statistics and market cap. Market cap is market capitalization. And this is recalculated every day. Because every day the stock price changes. Okay? But the book value of equity is different than the market value of equity. Book value of equity is based on how much assets do I have? Okay? How much liabilities do I have? Then What's left over? That's equity. Okay? Assets minus liabilities equals equity. So the market
market may value the assets of the company very differently than the company values them. For example, the building. How does the university value the building? The market value would be the amount it would get for the building if it sells it tomorrow. Okay? The book value would be the amount it paid for the building or the amount it cost to build the building when it built the building. Okay? Maybe plus inflation, maybe not. Okay? Maybe plus inflation of 2% every year. So accountants like to use the book value because it's more conservative. The book value will be lower, usually. Okay? And the book value is, is uh, more reliable over the longer term. Market value changes more. Okay? But uh, we're going to use, for calculating uh, the cost for the company, we want to use the, the up-to-date figures, so we use the market value. Market value of debt and market value of equity. Okay? So let's take a break then uh, for 10 minutes.